The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are coming to you live from many different places around Southern California and I think actually around the country today. I'm not sure where Bonnie's going to be coming to us from today. We'll ask her. But we're thrilled to be here with you this morning and to be with you live. There's a lot going on and there's a lot going on this week. So let me key you into a couple of, of things here. We're gonna be with you live for the next hour talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. We welcome the entire autism community. That starts with individuals who are on the autism spectrum themselves. They are the beating heart, the center of this community. And we, of course, welcome individuals who have that diagnosis and we wanna help them to get to all the things that they're looking for. But we also welcome everyone who loves those individuals. So if you are a mom, dad, caregiver, uh, grandparent, uncle, teacher, therapist, um, pediatrician, uh, doctor, trying to think of all the different things, all the different walks of life that we welcome here. Anyone who loves someone on the autism spectrum, how about boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, right? We love being here for you. Our mission always is to provide you with information and inspiration. And we like to be free uh, to you in all the different places that we are. So we want to remind you that there are tons of way that you, ways that you can connect with us. Trayvon, I don't know if we can show that slide because there's one new one that I keep forgetting all the time. But uh, there are a bunch of different ways to watch the show. If you're watching us live right now, you might be watching us on YouTube or on Facebook or on Twitter or Periscope. Now, uh, or you could be watching us on our homepage, autism-live.com. Later on today, we will still be playing on all of those wonderful places, but we will also podcast the show to iTunes where we're a free download. You can download just the audio portion to take us on your hike, or you can download picture and sound and have the full experience if you choose to. We are also available as a podcast on Deezer, on iHeartRadio, we are on Spotify, Ghana, and there's a new one. I don't even know if it is. Draven's got it there for you. Uh, look at look at all those. Oh, Audible. I forgot Audible. And Autism Music, or excuse me, Amazon Music is just getting started. Uh, and we don't know if they've actually gone live yet. I, they were supposed to go live sometime in September. We'll see if that is there. But we have our library set up there. So on the day that they go live, we will be there live. So... All of these places, we are available to you. Now, if you look at this and you go, hey, why aren't you on such and such platform? It's really only for one of two reasons. One, uh, we, we aren't currently on any platforms where it costs you money to be able to listen to what we have. Uh, that, that could change at some point, but we have always had the mission of being free to you, the people who are needing this information. The other reason why we might not be there is because we may not know about it. So if you have a site that you love to watch your podcast, please let us know and we'll be happy to figure out if we can get ourselves on there. Draven is so good at getting us uh, set up and started on all these places. So we hope that you will participate and that not only will you participate, but that you will tell others and whatever platform you like to watch us. So give us a like on Facebook, follow us on uh, Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, give us a, a review on iTunes. All of those things help other people to find us 
And that's always a thrill for me when somebody finds us and goes, I didn't know you were here. We're here, we're here for you. And you know what I always like to say, we can do this together. We hold hands virtually, si se puede, we can, we can do this. Okay, uh, so uh, you'll definitely wanna tune in this week because we have a ginormous week this week. Starting off uh, today, we're gonna have special education attorney Bonnie Yates joining us in just a little while to answer your questions and to give us some topics and ideas about things that we probably are concerned with, especially with all the distance learning. Although a lot of you have gone hybrid now. And I gotta be honest with you, I'm waiting to hear from you guys about how this is working. Here in California, that is not an option. Not right now, at least not in Los Angeles, but we'd love to hear if you're doing a hybrid model and how that is working for your kiddo on the autism spectrum. I'm terribly interested in that. So today is Bonnie and we're going to be, you know, doing some other things today too. Tomorrow. Let's talk a little bit about tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes, it's true. It's my birthday. Uh, and for my birthday, we're having the fabulous Dr. Temple Grandin on live. We are still taking questions, you guys. If you have a question for Dr. Temple Grandin, please write it in to me now because I'm going to be finalizing the questions for her probably in a couple of hours and sending them off to her. We really very likely won't be taking questions live. She will be live. She will be answering questions live, but she would like the questions beforehand. So be writing those in. I know you're all going to get frustrated with me tomorrow when you're writing in live questions, but I'm telling you now, we're taking the question bank beforehand. Then on Wednesday, we have the fabulous Evelyn Kung is going to be with us for Ask Evelyn Kung and be answering your questions from a clinical nature. On Thursday, it's been maybe five years since we have had Michael Tolson Robles with us. He is, uh, he calls himself a savant autistic painter artist. The things he paints, whoo, and he can, sometimes he takes a little while painting, but I have seen him, he does live performances one of those painters who he just takes four paintbrushes at a time and he's painting and then the, the picture reveals itself to you. It's, he, you got to check out his stuff, you guys. He's pretty amazing. He didn't discover that he was on the autism spectrum until later in life. And right at the same time, he was discovering that he could paint. He had no idea that he could paint. So it's really an amazing story. He's going to be with us on Thursday to talk about that. And then on Friday, we're going to round it out with Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. And we're going to have Leah Hirschfeld here with us to explain some of the hottest new research in the field of autism. Explain it to us and tell us why we should be paying attention to that. So that'll round out the week for us. It's a pretty big, big week. I'm very excited about it. So today is Monday and we like to start the week off with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. <laughs> this is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we try to make heads or tails out of what the experts are talking about. We first give you the actual definition and whenever possible, we make as much fun of it as possible because usually that's about all we can get from it. And then we move on to a working definition, which sometimes makes the expert break out into hives. And that's just an added plus, right? Uh, but really what we're doing is trying to break it down so that you can begin to understand what these terms mean to you in your life, wherever you are today. Because if it's not useful to you, I don't know about you, but I don't really have time for it. I, I know I'm very fond of telling you here that we have lots of experts that are on the show and I'm not one of them. My qualification to be here is that I'm a parent. When my son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half and people started using these terms, I was like, the what, the ha, huh, mm -hmm. when, what? <laughs> and then I would ask, what does that mean? When I was feeling brave, because sometimes I wasn't, right? Just being honest. Sometimes I would say, what, did that, what does that mean? And then I would have less idea when they would tell me their explanations, right? So we like to give you something a little bit just so that you can be adding that jargon into the bank of things that you have a beginning of understanding. Be kind to yourself. If you don't get it the first time out, don't worry about it because we cycle through a lot of these terms and eventually these think something will click and you'll go, oh, that's that. That's what she was talking about. Oh, I get it. And then when you do, it will, you will bring a new understanding to what you're working on and what it really can mean, which is progress, right? 
So, uh, you know, I'm working on the toy guide right now. We are really perilously close to finishing the toy guide. So let me throw this out there. Uh, we're going to be talking about play for the next week. But if you have a toy, new or old, that you want to recommend to be one of our toy guide winners for 2020, please, you need to write to me. ASAP, or you can write it on whatever way that you're watching. Tell us what toy you recommend. Uh, but today's term is symbolic play. All right, because uh, the other day we did functional pretend play. So what exactly is symbolic play? I've said this before that when we break down play into these very you know tight categories and we're like, well, this is this type of play and we're getting very technical about it. Sometimes it's like, why? Why would you wanna do that with play? But the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of our kiddos have issues in the play category. It feels like work to them. The example I always use is Angry Birds. A lot of you loved playing Angry Birds back in the day, right? I hated it. To me, it felt like work. Like, oh, I have to throw this thing and I have to knock those things down. And what exactly is in it for me? And I remember sitting with someone who was obsessed with it. And I was like, why? Why do you even like that? And they were like, oh, this is so much fun. And it's exciting. And it's, you know, and, I, and I was hearing all these things that told me it was rewarding for them not for me, not for me. And we must remember that play for our kiddos on the autism spectrum can start out like that, feeling like a job. Now that friend kind of tuned me into, okay, so here's the, here's the thing with Angry Birds and here's why it can be reinforcing for you. They didn't use that word, right? They said, here's why, here's why you might like it, Shannon, which was different than how they liked it, right? But eventually, you know, I never, never got into it. But I could play Angry Birds and not feel like it was an epic waste of my time, all right? So play is not an epic waste of time for our kiddos. It's a safe place to learn. It's a really safe place for them to try out their social skills, to try language on and not necessarily get it right, but not feel bad about it, right? So we really, and, and so many of our adults, teenagers and adults have anxiety, right? On the spectrum and not on the spectrum. And we know that if we give proper play skill, skills and leisure skills, that that can help mitigate that anxiety piece. So play is important. And when it's not working, sometimes we have to break it down to go, oh, that's the part that isn't working. And then we shore up that and we see that all the other types of play will fall into place. That's why we take it down to the level that we're taking it down. So today's term, symbolic play. Doesn't that sound like something we all want to study? Okay, let's take a look at our actual definition, Draven, to see how much there is to be made fun of. The play definitions aren't that bad. Let's take a look. So symbolic play is endowing objects with other qualities to play with them in a socially relevant uh, way and appropriate ways. Okay, if I don't know what symbolic play is, then endowing ob objects with other qualities, I'm like, what? What are we talking about here? So if you think back to last week, and last week we were talking about functional pretend play, and that's the toys that look like the real thing. It, lo it looks like a vacuum cleaner, but it's a toy vacuum. Cleaner. It looks like a cash register, but it's a toy cash register. So let's take it the next stop over and get to symbolic play. Let's look at our uh, working definitions so that we can see uh, what symbolic play might be. Go ahead to our, there we go. Using imagination to turn an object into a functional toy. So for instance, if we have, we, you know, we might have, um, the vacuum cleaner, let's stick with that. And uh, we have the toy vacuum cleaner and we run it across the carpet and it looks like the vacuum cleaner and it makes little popping um, you know, noises that come up through the little clear thing. And it's like a vacuum cleaner, right? Well, great. That's a great way to play and we're learning through imitation and it's wonderful. But if we wanna take it to the next step, because eventually we wanna get to that imaginative creative play, right? Then we want to take an object that is not a vacuum cleaner and we want to give it the properties of a vacuum cleaner. So I could take my cell phone and I can go and run it across the carpet and make the noise of a vacuum cleaner. And I can be acting as if it's a vacuum cleaner, but it's not, right? And a lot of times when you do this with kiddos, they go, what just happened? You're breaking every rule that there is 
And they sometimes will have a little anxiety about it and be like, mm, no, 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 this is a phone. We, you know, we do this with the phone, right? So think about that for just a second, because one of the things that we want to instill in our kiddos on the autism spectrum is flexibility, because flexibility will allow them in play, will allow them to be flexible uh, at school. It will allow them to be flexible socially with their friends. It will allow them to be flexible when something happens that is not in their fixed you know, this is how I'm comfortable. And if we do it in play, then the stakes are not as high, right? Because we don't want to be, you know, creating everything is chaos and everything is anxiety. But this is an area that I really love to introduce to kiddos. Because if they, you know, if they're doing the functional pretend play toys, and that's like very regimented, and it's like, I'm going to make the sandwich, and I have my toy bread, and I'm making the sandwich, it all makes sense to me, right? But when I pick up my, my phone, and I decide, oh, I'm going to make a sandwich, and now it becomes a piece of bread, and I go, oh, I'm going to put some cheese on it. <gasps> How about a tomato? And I'm going to stick a little turkey on my sandwich, and I got to have the bread on the top, and now I'm done, and I eat my sandwich. <laughs> literally the kids go, you're out of your mind. They're not saying that, right? But you can tell it on their faces. They're like, what just happened? But if you model it and you make it fun for them, what it does is it just opens them up and you encourage them to play with lots of different things that like, you know, I pick up my water bottle and go, hello. Oh, it's a phone call. It's for you. Right. And, and you watch, I love to watch kids learn and think. I just think that watching people think is one of the most compelling things that there is. You know that old um, game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And everybody was like, why does everybody love watching this? Because you got to watch someone in real time think with pressure on, right? And watching someone think is a pretty exciting thing. And in a kiddo, oh, it's so exciting. So uh, when you model this in lots of different ways, and when you hand the water bottle off to them and say, you know, put your ear up again, oh, it's grandma. What does grandma say? Now we're kicking in to some places in their brain where they're having to make it up instead of what's physical and hard and real. And if we can start doing that with kiddos and build that, that carries into teenage years and adulthood and serves them so well. I'm sure we've all met someone who has that thing that they call the functional fixedness where you know they they look at a hammer and a hammer can only be a hammer. Uh, and people who don't have functional fi fixedness can use a hammer as a doorstop or you know they can use it as a, a thing to throw at something to knock something down, hopefully not, right? So we want our kids to be flexible thinkers, right? So symbolic play, awesome. And it's that next stepping stone before we go off the cliff and get into imaginative play where we're making it up and we don't even have an object. Woo, exciting. The first time I ever saw my son do symbolic play, uh, he was really into, he had this little fishing pole that the speech teacher would do and he would have to catch fish and then he would have to say the color of the fish, right? To encourage him to speak and he really loved his fishing pole. And um, we went to one of those big warehouse stores and they have those big carts that you can sit on. And so he decided he wanted that cart that day. He was a little, little. And he sat on the cart and he had his, he used, he pretended it was a boat. He endowed the shopping cart with the characteristics of a boat. And he pretended that everything else in the store was water, which was awesome. That's symbolic play. And he fished off the side of the big flatbed shopping Art. And I was so excited and proud and thrilled. And he's a very creative and imaginative kiddo as a result of, in the beginning, you know, he, he wouldn't have done that. So this is a great way to play with your kiddos um, and it helps them exponentially. Okay, let's take a look. We have a question of the day, as we always do. And you can be writing in your question on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, what's the best gift you've ever gotten? Because, you know, I'm making that toy and gift guide. And one of the sections of the gift guide is just for... Um, so it goes by different categories. So there's the baby and toy category. There's the preschool category, the school age, the tween and teen, the adults. 
And then there is a category for caregivers. So if you're watching the show, you're somewhere, somewhere on that list, right? Uh, what's the best gift that you ever got? It could be as a child and I can plug that into uh, for, the, for the kiddos or maybe as an adult or as someone who is the caregiver for someone on the autism spectrum. So what's the best gift you've ever gotten? I say all the time that uh, my husband gave me the two best gifts I ever got, that he loves me for who I am, not in spite of it. Bless that man. <laughs> he has the patience of a saint. And that, but that has been a huge gift in my life. But also um, he made me a mom and my son is the greatest gift. But if it was a purchase gift that somebody gave me, oh my gosh, I would have to say I have this fabulous Saratoga trunk. I'm originally from Saratoga, New York and my parents, I think it was my 21st birthday. They gave me this beautiful trunk that we still have and I cherish that trunk. It's a fabulous thing. Okay, moving on, but what have you gotten? I wanna know, what are the great gifts that you guys have gotten? Okay, moving on, we always have a topic of the week. And our topic this week, just for you guys, is enjoying the passage of time. I'm a big fan of James Taylor, and he has a song that's from, like I wanna say the mid seventies. Uh, it's called The Secret of Life. And he says in the opening line, the secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. It's really hard right now. I know we're all facing a lot of different challenges and there's a little bit of feeling like we're stuck in Groundhog Day, right? Where every day suspiciously looks a lot like uh, the day before, although we're about to have a season change. And I just want to encourage all of you, we're going to be talking about this all week long. This is our life this right now. I know that for many of us, we're thinking, we were thinking, well, you know, this COVID thing and this distancing, it's just going to be for a short while. It's not looking that way now. And uh, I really want to make the case that there's so much to be progress. There's so much uh, love and excitement to be found in this moment right now. This is going to change and this is going to pass and it's not always going to be this way, but this is still our life. And if a year goes by and we are in this sort of bubble and everybody's bubble looks a little bit different, right? We want to make sure that we use this time well and that we enjoy it because I guarantee you, even for those of you that this is the hardest time of your life. There is going to come a day when you're going to look back at this and there are going to be aspects of it that you're going to think of fondly. I, you know, because we're working on the toy guide and we're getting ready to launch our sensitive Santa events for, we're still doing them, but we're doing them in a vastly different way, you guys. Um, you know, someone was asking me on Saturday, why did you start the sensitive Santa event? And I said, because there was one Christmas early on when my son had just been diagnosed and there was just not enough money. It was not, I did the bills on the 1st of December and realized that there was not enough money to do the three things that I had left to do, which were to have a Christmas, special Christmas dinner, have a, a really spectacular toy for my son and pay for his medications. That I could pretty much do one of those, not really even fully two of them, but for sure all three couldn't happen. And that was a dark, dark day. And I sobbed when I realized, I was like, well, I have messed up my life because I'm not able to do these three things. And it wasn't that I had messed up my life. We had some extenuating circumstances. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but acknowledging it and, uh, and, and talking about it and saying, what can I do about it? made room for, I've said this before, that uh, right, right as I was going through this, uh, a bunch of things changed and a bunch of people kind of took us in under their wings and took hold of us. Somebody called me out of the blue and said, rather than give to ha Habitat for Humanity this, this year, I want to donate money for your son's medications. What? <laughs> How does that happen? And I cried tears of joy and then a TACA member, they were doing adopt a family and they adopted our family and gave us all gifts. It was the best Christmas, you guys, the best Christmas. So I can look at it and look back and go, worst Christmas, because I had this devastating reality, but in fact, it was the best Christmas. And I'm telling you that we will look back on some aspects of this 
with a fond memory, right? I know it's hard right now, but we will. So I would rather not wait and utilize this time and enjoy whatever it is that you can. And that's going to look different for different people. But for some of you, it's a time to really buckle down and be working on things so that your child makes progress. For some of you that maybe you're a teenager on the spectrum and it's a time to really hone social skills in the safe environment online so and meet new friends so that you'll be ready for the world when we get back to meeting face to face. And I'm sure there's a million other examples. So just reminding you this week, we're going to enjoy the passage of time because as James Taylor says, that is the secret of life. So there you go. Okay, so as I mentioned today on the show, we are being joined by special education attorney Bonnie Yates. She is with the law offices, the Tolner Law Offices, and they work in the entire state of California. I believe that they have some services in Nevada, and I know that they have services in Arizona as well. Bonnie is here to sort of broaden our knowledge about what our rights are. And I believe that she is here with us. And Traven, if you want to tell her, she can go ahead and start her camera and join us. We adore Bonnie and are thrilled that we get the opportunity to be with her on a weekly basis. There she is. How are you, madam? Oh, we don't, you're muted. And she's gone. <laughs> she's changing the lighting. We'll, uh, we'll have her back in just a second. But doesn't it look pretty out that window? You always have the best views, Bonnie. Well, this is this is my view from a room that I'm lucky enough to occupy in my daughter's house. Um, and she lives in a pretty um, area where there's lots of huge trees and nice noises of wind moving through trees and things like that. And am I correct that you are in fact on the East Coast then today? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm being a grandma for as long as I can get away with it. And- and we were just talking about how there are some things that we will look back fondly on this period of time. And because of this distance, you're able to keep doing your job, but be sitting underneath your grandbaby. What a wonderful gift uh, out of all of the other muck. Yeah, completely, completely. Um, I love that you're enjoying it because no there's no time like the present. Yeah, no, he's delicious. Anyway, um, so did we have questions today? We don't have questions today, and I, uh, I, I want to say I think it's a, a combination of two things. What I'm hearing from parents is that they're in this first honeymoon period with their schools, and they're waiting to see how it actually goes. They're taking your advice. They're documenting things, right. and that, that IEPs are going to start up uh, next week. And so I think that we're going to have more questions as that revs up, uh, but also we're having Temple Grandin on tomorrow, so people are going to questions in for her. So I apologize for not have questions. Yeah, is my background still too dark? It you know it goes in and out, Bonnie. Uh, right now we've got you. It just depends on how we around. Moving it around. I think this is a bad place for me to sit. That's my well question. it when you're too far away it looks like you're in the witness protection program. I am moving. <laughs> if this works any better. That's yeah that's much better. Much better. Yeah, but I got to read. I got to read off of another screen. So that's the problem. Okay, let's get organized. So first of all, all right. why are we here? We're here because people who have children with disabilities need to be educated in the system that they'll be participating in from the time their child is first diagnosed till the time their child either graduates from high school or achieves the age of 22. So Toner Law Offices is an eight- attorney firm uh, based in San Jose, Los Angeles and Orange County. And courtesy of Tolner Law Offices, I try to come on uh, and talk to all the autism uh, live parents about issues that I hope will educate them about um, how to best negotiate a robust uh, array of services for your child, whether it's through the school district or regional center. And there's a lot of information on our website so you can google toner law offices if you want and obviously too we try to share stuff with you after the show there's you know if there's things we want you to read uh shannon's been really good about disseminating that stuff so i think last week we talked about the norris school district case in california 
which said in essence that if the district doesn't give you prior written notice and you try their distance learning plan and you try to work with them and your child can't access the services and you make a demand for in-person services and the district can't fulfill that, then it might be uh, incumbent upon the district to actually pay for those services that the child is missing through a non-public school or agency. Um, what I'm finding when I interact with parents and I'm trying to prepare them for an IEP meeting, which they might be attending on their own, um, their people are, are really good at telling me that the distance learning isn't working. But what you need to do is you need to A, have a, a, a meaningful period of engagement, perhaps a couple of months, where you're actually troubleshooting with the district and trying to make it work and documenting what happens. But the other thing is people are saying, oh, the distance learning doesn't work for me. My kid just really spaces out. I mean, that's not going to cut it. It's got to be a really factual, almost like taking data, you know, in five minute blocks. Okay, so first when he tried to tune into the screen, he started, you know, when he was supposed to attend, he started humming instead. Um, then I redirected him and 30 seconds later, he started picking at his fingernails. I mean, it really has to be um, data driven because what they're doing is they're coming into the Zoom meetings and they're saying, well, we think this is working fine. And like one teacher said, the mom said, well, I think the student's really behind in this class and he's not accessing the work. And the teacher said, well, actually he corrected me on a, on a sloppy mistake that I made. You know, so, so just like in the IEP land of old, now that administrators have gotten their feet wet with the technology and the process, they're coming in and doing the same old, same old, which is saying that this is, you know, this is working just fine and, and, and your kid's doing, you know, really well with this. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just something that is gonna require a huge amount of energy from parents to really effectively document, but there's not any other way around it. So. Um, Do you think Bonnie, and forgive me if this is a ridiculous question, but. I don't think there are any. Well, I'm not sure, but I feel like there's a difference in the expectations and that we're, and that people aren't disclosing what their expectations are. That, you know, as a parent, my son, you know, as far as I'm aware, my son is, a, is entitled to a free appropriate, appropriate public education. And that just because we're in COVID, that we shouldn't, you know, we don't have an, a, an expectation of less. I understand that it's harder, but I feel like some, what I'm hearing from some people is that teachers and districts have said, look, this year is going to kind of be a wash and we're not giving the expectation that our kids are going to access the full curriculum of what we had would normally have planned, the standards that we normally have planned for our even our neurotypical kiddos and the special ed kids are like in that there's no expectation that we're going to make progress this year. Are you feeling that or is that just well, me? That's not what the federal government is saying the district's obligation is. And did you share the Norris School District case with people? We have not shared that and I apologize. We need to Well, I think that that's an important case for people to read because what it does in part is it gives you the history between June and or excuse me, March and now in terms of what the state of California did in response to what the federal government told them. And the things that the federal, federal government told California would apply equally in the other 49 states. And they basically said, look, you may not be able to provide distance learning. I mean, you may not be able to implement the IEP in the same way as you would have if you were actually um, in a classroom face to face with these students. But you still have an obligation to offer you know, a free appropriate public education and implement the IEP to the best of your ability via either distance measures, bringing students in to a school site to work with them one-on-one -on -one, or paying other people who can come into the home if you, if you district aren't willing or able to send your personnel in to do the face-to-face -face services. So I think, okay, look, the reality is, and this is just my, opinion, and it's not even really a legal opinion, it's a life opinion, okay? The reality is there is a pandemic, and if you get COVID and you're my age, you got a good chance of dying. 
So um, that's, that's a reality on the ground. And I don't know, you know how young people have to be to not be worried about dying, but obviously there are a bunch of teachers out there that are worried about dying and don't really wanna be forced back until they're comfortable to be in a teaching environment. And so you have, you have on one hand that you have the tension of what the federal government is telling people, you know, teachers and public school administrators that they have to do. And then on the other hand, there is the, you know, the health reality. But when I talk on the show, I'm not really talking about what the health reality is for anybody who's, you know, doing face-to-face -face instruction. I'm leaving that to, you know, the, the state and federal government. What I am talking about is what the federal government has said the states have to do to fulfill their obligations under the IDEA during school closure. And if districts are shrugging and saying, well, this year's just gonna be a wash, that is fine, they can do that, but they're gonna meet that mess later because the federal government has made it very clear that as soon as school reopens, there's gonna be an IEP meeting to figure out what the student didn't get, what they're gonna get now instead. So I'm just trying to keep everybody afloat to the best of our ability until you can go back to school and have a discussion about what comp ed you're owed, okay? And I, I think that that phrase to the best of, of your ability is, I think that's the whole linchpin of it, right? Because different people's interpretations of it. But we yeah, do have a viewer who has written in a question. Sure. How, how long do we stick it out with the social distance plan before we switch to homeschool? I know it's gonna take time to adjust and I'm willing to put up with meltdown, but it, if it's affecting his whole day and will trigger his meltdowns, how long is too long? And she says she has a five-year-old stage two nonverbal. Well, I, I, I threw out the number two months for, you know, and, and normally when I tell people they need data, I say one quarter, that's three to four months. I think if you do two weeks and you complain that it isn't working, you're gonna lose your hearing, okay? Not, not your auditory capacity, but you would lose in a due process hearing. That's not enough data, okay? So I, you know, do as much as you can stand and try to hit the two month mark. And while you're trying to hit the two month mark, document daily what your concerns are, what's going wrong and ask for help. One of the options that we don't see being used is parent training. But there's been a lot of stuff on LRP about how, look, if your parents are telling you that they're having these huge problems with distance learning, you know, do some parent training with them and troubleshoot and see if you can solve some of these things. But the, the truth of the matter is it's a subjective, it's a, it's a subjective decision, decision or determination as to whether the district's distance learning plan was reflective of best efforts to try to implement the IEP via distance learning. And you know, the, the burden of proof is still gonna be on the parent to show that the district didn't offer FAPE. So you don't wanna have just a bunch of subjective statements about how it didn't work and your kid, you know, wasn't learning. You need to really make them see what the problem is. And I have one family whose son developed a lot of sensory behaviors that he supposedly had grown out of, um, which she thinks is due to too much screen time. And I said to her, Get out your phone, and when these meltdowns are occurring, let's shoot them and and send them off. Because I think a picture is worth, you know, a thousand words or a hundred thousand words, you know, whatever the expression is. I can't remember. Um, but I I do have uh, continuing guidance that's being given to school districts um, by school district attorneys about various aspects of this, and so I do have some stuff to read if we have time. Okay. Yes, we do. But let me just say too, that one of the things that you taught me early on, Bonnie, was that, that everything that I documented made it easier for you as an attorney. And that one of the things that I didn't know that I guess everybody in the legal world knows is document, 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 including um, that basically what you taught me is don't expect them to read my mind and to put everything in writing. So if he has a bad day and he melts down and I talk to the teacher about it um, in person or on the phone, 
to write an email and say, as per our conversation today, when we talked about the meltdown he had in class and you told me that I should try this, I want to let you know that I'm on board and I'm trying it. Because yep. then when you send the email tomorrow saying, just wanted to let you know, I tried it, it didn't work, but I'm going to try it again. So that you create this trail that shows you participated. You're cooperating, you're trying it, you're not refusing it out of hand. And the other yeah. thing is, you know, if you say my son had a 30 minute tantrum, believe me, if you have a 30 minute, uh, you know, audio, video or audio clip of a 30 minute tantrum, that's going to be much more powerful than just, oh, you had a 30 minute tantrum. Yeah. So, okay. Nobody, so Nobody believes us when we say our kid has a 30 minutes. It's so bad. People are like, how could you possibly survive this? Which, you know, yeah. the answer is. Um, we do survive, but, you know, you don't come out of doing 15 years of autism triage without, you know, significant impact on how you react to situations and how you live your life. Amen. You know? I mean, I do. And before you start to read, Bonnie, I, I just want to give a shout out that somebody has written in and said, my child just got diagnosed with autism. We just want to welcome you here and, and hope that you find the message is here of things that you, that will help you but that a lot of us have, have gotten through that day. It may not be the best day of your life, but I wanna, I wanna say to you, congratulations, because now you can start to get services to help your child. Yep. Please write us in and tell us where you're at and how we can help you. But uh, Bonnie, I'm turning it back over to you. You had something you wanted to read to us. Yeah, I do. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna like look to my left here and read because I just didn't print this out. So. The, the question basically is what the districts are, are talking about internally in terms of things they should be doing to make the distance learning work. So I just you know went on their site, Special Ed Connection, and they have a COVID roundup and I just, I just found a couple of goodies. Okay, so we'll see how far we get. This one, this one talks about you know, how to support and collaborate with parents um, who are doing a distance learning plan, okay? So um, this is, you know, they're telling, this is like for, let's say you are the special ed director of a public school district, you might go on and you might read this and it's definitely directed to you. It says, your system to provide remote instruction to students with significant disabilities at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic may not have been as solid as you would have wanted. Indeed, districts had to pivot quickly to deliver instruction in the spring or to continue to deliver instruction in the spring. As you plan for remote learning during the new school year, put in place additional sports supports and ideas for collaboration with parents so students, including those with complex communication, behavioral and motor needs can make progress. If you can't say this has been working, you need to begin this year with a fresh look. You have to engage in student-centered planning that also brings the parents along. Use the ideas below to ensure students with significant disabilities can meaningfully learn remotely, whether full-time or as part of a hybrid model of in-person and remote instruction. So, I mean, this is basically them having their discussion about how they should be responding to us, right? Okay, so the first thing they say is discuss the learning environment at home. So don't run from this question, discuss it with parents. Bring teachers, related service providers and parents together on a video conference to discuss what the parent needs to create a supportive environment for the student to learn at home and how the parent can access those items. A student with complex needs may benefit from adaptive seating to, lead, to learn comfortably at a desk or table a room free of visual distractions, including non-therapeutic pets, so the student can more easily focus. A visual activity schedule with pictures and words posted on a whiteboard or other large space that offers step-by-step -step information on what the student can expect to do during the day. Offer concrete supports. Send home graphic organizers and social stories to help the student navigate lessons. Also make choice boards available online or in print to promote student engagement. If your school adopts a hybrid model of in-person and remote learning, make sure what you send home is identical to what you are using in school with the student to maintain continuity. Um, assess assistive technology use. 
Do not flood the student with picture symbols on his tablet or laptop without fully reviewing what vocabulary he knows. Sometimes we provide an iPad with 32 icons and the student only knows six, that's overwhelming. Work with the parent on what the student knows and needs to know so that his work on tasks while learning is student initiated and not adult manipulated wherever possible. You may wanna send home a device pre-programmed with your voice with just a few choices for answers such as yes or no. If the student typically points or presses a button to respond to questions. Can I keep going? Or do you have- Yeah, okay. yeah, no we can go. Okay, incorporate multimedia techniques. Ensure virtual lessons incorporate multimedia elements such as colorful pictures and videos, music and interactive ga and music and interactive games. For example, invite the student to press a button to indicate which choice is a character in a story she's reading. You can move the cursor over the options to help the student choose, or you can share your screen and highlight the options as you would in person. You may want to put a bag of objects together, such as foam, dice, and marbles for the student to use at home while you uh, engage her in a slide presentation and use the same objects to ask her questions and see what she knows. Okay, here's the last one. Okay. Let student learn from mistakes. Don't be afraid to correct the student remotely. If you ask a student to count out five marbles and the student continues to count out marbles beyond five, make sure you stop the student and say, no, this is five. Just be sure you're not over prompting and you're giving the student time to think. For example, if you ask a student to read aloud the correct word on the screen out of three options and the student doesn't read it aloud right away, wait a little bit before you prompt the student with the correct response. You wanna use the system of least prompts, she said. Okay. This is all great advice. And I, I guess my question is, what, because this is a closed site, do you have to be, subscribe? Do all teachers have access to this? Uh, I don't know whether teachers have it through their districts or whether it's just special ed administrators. I don't, I don't really know who it is, but if you guys want to, you know, fiddle around with this, go to special ed connection and they can, pro they'll probably give you a trial. There you go. You know? Because these are great, these are always great tips that you share with us from this website. And I just, I, I want to hear stories of parents that have staff that are utilizing this, right? Yeah, it's, right. Not, it's not what we're hearing. Right. No, it's not what we're hearing. So I don't know. I just know that it's a very well um, subscribed to service. Um, the other one that I have, I'm just going to send to you, I think, unless we have a few more minutes. No, we've got time. Okay. So this one is called does the pandemic impact IEP team decisions to exit students from special education? So this is another way of, of talking about the same thing, which is the trigger for compensatory education that is the pandemic, right? I mean, so the, 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 the question is, are you gonna get extra time because you were a 12th grader and you were supposed to graduate this year with a high school diploma but you really didn't get anything done for the last three months of school and fall isn't looking too much better. So this is, this is from, how do I advise my clients? So this, this is like sort of what you're talking about. It says, this is a special uh, feature of special ed connection that provides expert opinions from attorneys and education consultants for overcoming common problems and core challenges in the field. Each installment includes insights from multiple stakeholders offering you a variety of perspectives to strengthen your efforts to serve students with disabilities. The COVID-19 outbreak is causing educators to consider how to restructure special education services while maintaining compliance with the IDEA. One important activity that requires comprehensive review during this time is how and when to terminate a student's IEP services before the student graduates or ages out of special ed eligibility. Should districts even consider exiting students with disabilities during the pandemic? If they do, what additional considerations must be given, uh, must be made given the unprecedented extended school closures? Um, so then they, they, they interview different people about this and give their answers. So the first guy they talked to was a lawyer in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. And he says, in almost all situations, I would not recommend exiting a student from special education during the pandemic. Uh, students exit, uh, oops, oops, oops. Um, exiting a student who demonstrated a continued need for special education prior to the pandemic 
solely based on data collected during remote learning is not a best practice and could potentially result in significant liability for the school district. However, in rare circumstances where the district has strong data from early in the school year supporting the exit um, and the, DAC, the data obtained during remote learning bolsters the position and there's agreement from the parents, it may be acceptable for the student to be exited from special education so long as the additional requirements for exiting the student can also be met. I suggest making these considerations before exiting a student. Complete an evaluation in all areas of suspected disability to determine that the student is no longer a child with a disability. Um, the school district will need to determine whether assessments can be safely conducted. It is possible that the determination can be made through a review of records, but only if there's enough current data to document the student's present levels of academic achievement and performance to recognize that the child is no longer a child with a disability and determine the student no longer needs special education and related services. However, it is unlikely that a district will have current data that is both complete and accurate given the unique learning environments that these students have experienced since March. Any decision regarding exiting a student from special education must be made by the IEP committee together. Given the current health crisis, the IEP committee will likely need to meet virtually. However, the school district needs to make sure that every member of the IEP committee has access to the meeting. COVID-19 is no excuse. In this situation, it's important to consider whether the student continues to have needs that should be met through a section 504 plan in, in lieu of an exit. This may help minimize any challenges a student might face upon returning to campus without any of their previous special education supports in place. So that th this is um, a partner in this firm. Uh, and then they go on and they asked other, they asked another partner in another firm what he thought. I don't think we need to read that, but I'm gonna forward both of these to you, Shannon, so you can share them with people. But the point is, isn't it interesting that when people are behind closed doors, they are acknowledging that they probably don't have good data to support exiting a student from special education and that there's almost no circumstances in which it's not going to be extremely risky to do it. Well, and for me, this is a, like I would I would say to every caregiver out there that this is not the year to exit your child from their IEP, like just, you know, and don't let anybody steamroll that that to happen. But what is also interesting to me is that within the confines of that, they're admitting that they don't have good data. But if we're just looking at kids that know we're not looking to exit from the IEP, they tell us, oh, we, we know exactly what we're doing. We have this yeah. well in hand and the kids are making progress and, and <laughs> I'm just like doing a lot of this. Well, yeah, it's uh, what they said at IEP meetings when, you know, back when we weren't doing distance learning and we didn't agree with that either. But I think this also circles back to the beginning of the, of the conversation where, you know, if the school district's going to bring forward data about how great you did during your distance learning program, don't you want to have data that shows that actually you were, you were the one on the, you know, this is where the, the whole thing is reversed. Parent is now the one on the ground with the face-to-face yeah. -face access to the child. Yes. And so that, that, the, that data should be very, you know, credible data because they're closer, they're closer, you know, in than the district is. So yeah. there, there are multiple reasons why you need to document this. It's your insurance policy for a rainy day, you know. And I got to say, I think that parents need to document it on both sides. The parents, because we have many parents who have written in and said, um, my child just made more progress with us at home being his facilitator for what you're teaching than he does at school. So yep. we're afraid, what are you actually doing at school? Yep. Um, so, and I think that those parents need to be documenting that. And then we have the parents on the other side of the coin where, you know, their kid, they've got no help support and they set the computer up in front of their kid. And the parent is like, if I, you know, if I can't get him to sit there and listen to what you're saying. Um, and I feel for those parents, I feel for everybody. Document, document, document. And, really, and yeah. recall that in California, until relatively recently, um, districts were able to limit or completely block having an outside evaluator come into the classroom to see what's really going on. And that's because they knew that if, if that observation didn't occur, it was gonna be very hard for the expert to testify credibly in a due process hearing. Um, yeah. So, you know, 
school observations of what's really going on in the classroom are very powerful. And maybe this is something we should talk about next week, but sort of the thumbnail sketch of the concept would be what are outside professionals doing in order to conduct meaningful assessments during COVID? What, what is their process and how are, are they going into people's homes and observing their distance learning? What, what are they doing and how are they gonna handle the fact that they aren't gonna have an in-person you know, school observation, which um, I'm sure the districts are quite happy about, frankly. I sort of want to make the case for everybody, at least, I don't, I don't know for everyone whether you can be in the room while your child is going to school. That may not be the right thing for everyone, but you could at least set up your phone on one of those crazy little tripods that are available everywhere now. Yeah, you know, I, one session. I hate to say this because it's going to fall into hand, the hands that are going to probably, you know, I'm going to be like, oh, I should have kept that a secret. But one client pointed out to me that the district wouldn't let her behavioral team in the home. And so um, she has she has her insurance funded ABA team coming into the home during school time via another Zoom on another computer. Yeah. And, and of course, there are all kinds of issues that uh, everybody is trying to work out with that. I think people have to be very careful because well, that- But they're not seeing any faces. All they have is access to the audio. Right. But you're, I, you know, insurance, some insurance providers have said, yes, we will pay for that. Uh, we will fund that. Others are on the fence about it. And I think everybody uh, wants to make I sure was, that they know where the- I see. Is. I was thinking about it more from the standpoint of the confidentiality. Oh, right. well, there's that too. The school district is saying there are other children on the, on the Zoom call and their parents didn't give permission. Listen, I, I wish, I'm trying to get a movement where parents put, turn their kids' cameras on and parents are telling me, oh no, we don't want the cameras on for various and sundry reasons. And as a former teacher, I got to tell you, I, I, I think distance learning for our kids is a hard climb to begin with, but if the cameras aren't on, yeah, really, and, and we're finding out that there's all these Luddites that are teaching. I had a parent who was telling me the other day that it's a special ed class and the teacher is not muting any of them. So there's 12 kids in the class stimming and talking the whole time while she is trying to teach. She doesn't know how to turn off their mics. And I was like, oh, this is horrible. It's hard. Uh, I did tell that parent, you need to videotape and go back to the district and say, this is what you're giving my child. Um, this, cause it's a crazy, crazy world. Hey, we're saying hello to the folks who are writing in from Savannah, Georgia. Thank you for joining us. We are out of time, unfortunately, but Bonnie, I wanna thank you for being here. Tell them again uh, about Tolner Law Offices. Tolner Law Offices, T-O-L-L-N-E-R. If you want to have a complimentary consultation, go to our website and fill in the paperwork and we'll set that up for you if you're in the state of California. If you're not in the state of California, there's other information on the website that I think will be useful to you. So check that out. I will forward the two source references to you, Shannon, when we awesome. get off the thank call you. and you can share them with people. Thank you so much. We appreciate you so much and thank everybody at Tolner Law Offices for lending us to you for this hour. Listen, and we're all going through this together, right? We're doing our best. We're figuring it out. We're taking it well, one day at a time. We're figuring it out. We appreciate you holding hands with us while we wade through the muck. Okay. Uh, you're the best. Each other up. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> thank you so much. Everybody. I want to remind it. Thank you. I want to remind everybody that tomorrow we are back with Temple Grandin live at the top of the hour. She will be live, 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 but she's going to be answering questions that get sent to me, uh, like I, I have to turn them in in about an hour. So send over your questions for Temple Grandin. Remember that she doesn't like to answer questions that are technical, uh, you know, clinical in nature, but she loves to answer specific questions, give her lots of information about how old the individual is, what they're interested in. She loves, loves, loves getting your comments and your questions. Uh, and loves hearing from other individuals who are on the autism spectrum. She loves to be a, a, a flashlight in the dark. You know what I'm saying? So we will be back tomorrow. You know, I'm always excited to have Dr. Grandin with us. Uh, but until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.